Um, it's my um, privilege to be able to introduce Dr. Summer Wallace. Summer is from Hamilton, Illinois, or H-Town, as she refers to it. Uh, she got her bachelor's degree from Western Illinois University and got her medical degree from Southern Illinois University School of Medicine. Uh, she got her, did her OBGYN residency partly at Mayo Clinic, partly at University of Colorado, and then did her fellowship at the Mayo Clinic in GYN Oncology. Uh, we were lucky enough to recruit her here last year uh, and started in September in our division. Um, Summer has been uh, really leading the effort to do outreach in Rockford. She's there once a week uh, seeing GYN Oncology patients in Rockford, and she's been an excellent addition. Uh, to our group and we're really, really happy to have her here. So she's going to talk today about advocacy. So welcome Summer. Hello. Working, right? So I'm going to speak a little bit about advocacy this morning and then Connie Schultz is here to share the stage um, and give an update on a recent topic in our field. The title is supposed to be a little lighthearted, advocacy is easy, but um, can certainly be frustrating. With a little persistence and determination can be very rewarding, as we'll find out. Okay, so today we'll talk a little bit about advocacy in general, defining it, what types of advocacy, and why you would do this. We'll also talk a little bit about approaches, um, how you can get involved, give you some tips, suggestions, general information, and then some rules of the road. We're at a state agency, so a little guidance is probably necessary. Of course, hot topics. There's no lack of those in women's health and in OBGYN. Um, we'll be talking about specific issues or falling on one side of any issue, but there is certainly plenty to be passionate about. And then, like I said, Connie will touch on um, a little bit of advocacy success to wrap things up at the end. So what is advocacy? So if you look at the dictionary, the definition is the act or process of supporting a cause or proposal. An advocate is one who pleads the cause of another, one who defends or maintains a cause or proposal, one who supports or promotes the interests of a group or a cause, and the actual Example in the dictionary is an advocate for women's health. So I think by definition, we are all advocates. <laughs> Why should we do this? So number one, first and foremost, patients need our voice. Um, we are their biggest advocate. We help them navigate through the healthcare system, which is often confusing and overwhelming. Um, so we're doing that daily, but they ultimately need our voice for many other reasons as well. Number two, to, to be heard. So when we are um, talking about policy or how we're practicing, um, it's important for physician voices to be at the table. Uh, so laparoscopic versus open hysterectomy is a perfect example. And, and when you think about the different ways that that could go, you could be talking about reimbursement. You could be talking about more salation. But a physician should be there discussing that policy. Um, our voices should be heard when it comes to how we operate. Value-based care is important and is coming um, very quickly, if not already here. So with MIPS and different um, alternative payment models, physicians should definitely be heard when it comes to those things. And of course, patient satisfaction. This is a recent article in the Journal of the National Comprehensive Cancer Network that looks at quality measurements in cancer care. It is a, a group of physicians, business people, um, and lawyers who got together to look at quality care in cancer patients to try to get ahead of the curve. So they're looking at how we can improve outcomes, how we can improve reporting of metrics, um, getting ahead of the curve, having their voices heard before they're told what to do. So they're advocating for themselves in addition to advocating for patients. And of course, um, I think when people think of advocacy, they think of policy and politics, and that's important. So being an advocate, um, you can also influence policy. So research funding, as an example, ovarian cancer funding and through the government is funded through the Department of Defense, through the DOD. And um, the SGO, Society of Gynecologic Oncology, has 
what we'll touch on in a little bit, congressional ambassadors who advocate often for um, that funding to be renewed every year. So that is a process. Of course, as we've seen in the recent months and year, training programs can be affected by policy, so we should be, we should be worried and concerned about that. And then, obviously, reimbursement is a policy that we all can definitely affect and influence through advocacy. Um, so, th this is just a quote from Albert Einstein that I borrowed from Dr. Amy Leifert, who I'll mention again a little later, but the world is a dangerous place, not because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. Okay, types. So obviously being a patient advocate is important and that's what we're all doing every day. Um, we're also fortunate enough here at the University of Wisconsin to have a center for patient partnerships who um, helps patients in difficult situations with life-threatening illnesses. Meg Gaines is the director and co-founder. She's an ovarian cancer survivor and she's very invested in our patient population. You can also advocate for groups. So women's health, obviously that's what we're doing. That's the definition of the example in the dictionary. Um, different underrepresented populations. You can advocate for peers or for your profession. That's you know, reimbursement, different quality metrics that we might um, not always be excited to collect and report, but ultimately are important. And then of course policy, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, advocacy as a spectrum, this is one of my favorite Dr. Leibert um, concepts. So this is just looking at all the different ways. So patient, obviously advocacy is on the individual basis. Um, it's your, your individual patient or family, it's in the hospital, it's in the clinic, on the phone, advocating for your patient because the insurance company won't cover this resource or that procedure. Local advocacy, there are um, there are many different groups, committees, places in the community that you can get involved. It doesn't necessarily have to be for women's health. Dr. Jacques, for example, has been advocating for um, lunch times in schools. So there have been many different areas that you can go and look to be an advocate for. And of course, there's state and federal advocacy, which may seem more daunting when you're talking about um, advocating for policy or budgetary changes and resource allocations and things like that, but ultimately are important and can be easy. I did want to hopefully show you really quickly the partnerships website. So this is the Pate Center for Patient Partnerships. Um, this is Meg Gaines. She's amazing. I've worked with her with one patient in particular, um, and she made it happen. Um, so she's the, the definition of an advocate. But you can look through all of their different, um, you know, tabs here. They have different patient advocacies. Um, the history of this is that she co-founded it, um, and they are committed to improving healthcare quality and helping patients navigate through these difficult times. So if you get a minute to look through this, this is here at the University of Wisconsin, it's amazing. All right. So some quick guidelines, when you are um, passionate about a cause or you're out talking about certain things, it's important to remember who you're representing. Are you out there talking for a certain political campaign or a certain group of patients? Um, are you representing yourself or are you talking on behalf of the University of Wisconsin? If you're representing yourself, great. Um, have at it. You can buy all the bumper stickers and yard signs that you like. You can donate to whomever you want. You can send emails, send letters, be involved in committees. You can go door to door um, asking for votes. If you're representing the University of Wisconsin, you have to be a little bit more careful. So this is actually the website, I'm not going to go to it this morning, but you can um, check it out. It's got all the gory details of what you can and can't do. A quick summary though is that employees may not engage in political campaign activities or use university resources on university time. And you may not solicit contributions for political purpose from employees on their time. So you can't go stand by the cafeteria asking for donations on your day off, not allowed. 
ultimately just don't allow you while you're on university time unless it's in your job description. Okay, so ways to take action. You can educate, which is an important way to advocate, is just telling the general community, telling it, um, your peers about a certain topic, giving them more information on it than they may not have known. Um, you can join different national societies. So the AMA, AAFP, ACS, ACOB, all national societies that are um, involved in advocacy have a page or have a section that you can become involved in or that you can educate yourself on. Here at University of Wisconsin, Dr. Leibert is involved in the American College of Surgeons. Um, so it's a great resource for this. And like I said, has been so gracious to allow me to borrow some of her ideas. And ACOG here in Wisconsin, um, although they are not at the University of Wisconsin at this time, Kathy Hartke and Anna Windsor are ACOG representatives. Both the AMA and, and ACOG have um, PA political action committees, and so do the others, but those are the two that I'm going to comment on because they apply to us probably the most, especially ACOG. Um, you can do research. Just like that JNCCN article, you can do research that is um, involved in advocacy. You can vote, that's an ultimate um, vote of advocacy. And then you can also run for office. So if you feel very passionate about a certain issue and you feel like campaigning and becoming part of our local or state government, then so we. All right, so getting involved in national societies, you can go to the web, their, each individual society's webpage, which um, I'll show you in a little bit some of ACOG, which is excellent. Um, AMA also has their Patients Before Politics platform for their PAC. Super easy to get involved in that as well. Um, I mentioned the SGO Congressional Ambassadors a little bit earlier. That is the Society of Gynecologic Oncologies, um, you know, way to get involved from a policy standpoint. It's, it's actually very well run these days. They, uh, you know, have different platforms that they um, follow each, um, and they have a legislative liaison, essentially. And uh, it's just an organized way for the members to get involved, to send messages to representatives and to the advocates for all the various um, topics. I mean, of course, the American Cancer Society. Uh, locally, the Dane County and Wisconsin State Medical Societies are other places to get involved, and then there are various local committees and groups depending on what cause you're interested in. You can get involved by representing, I'm sorry, contacting your representatives. ACOG has um, a great page about that that I'll show you. Ultimately, you can email, you can call, write letters, um, you know, tweet. Social media is a good way, but you have to be a little careful, like we were saying earlier. Use your personal email, your personal social media accounts, um, unless you have it in your job description to be on University of Wisconsin representation. Uh, so keeping that in mind. So for ACOG, they have a wonderful advocacy section. They have a couple of educational articles. One is on communicating with elected officials. There's one on visiting Capitol Hill. But if you go to the website, you'll see that this is the Capitol Hill Basics Communicating with Your Elected Officials page. It basically gives you templates for contacting your elected officials, which makes it super easy. So tips on calling elected representatives, tips on writing, they remind you that um, when you contact representatives, it's staffers that receive this information and kind of triage it and send it on. Um, and they kind of help you navigate around and through that and, and to use those staffers in the best way. So this is a wonderful resource. Also on the ACOG website is an advocacy tab. So if you go just to the general website, you can click on advocacy, um, which is in green at the top, and it pulls up this page with multiple different ways that you can get involved, different um, topics that are in the news right now or that ACOG is following. So if you go down to the Legislative Action Center, which is at the bottom, then you can take action. And this will come up. This page has a bunch of great information. So it has an area for you to put in your zip code so that you can find out who your elected officials are in your area. Um, it also has at the bottom um, what ACOG is tracking. So what legislation is out there that ACOG is watching and maybe forming an opinion on. And if then, if you want to take action, um, you 
you can do so and they make it even easier through the website. So for example, um, in the middle of the page it says they're going to um, have a statement on the quality care of a mom's and babies act. So if that's something that you're interested in, you can click next and put in your, uh, your zip code and it'll come up with a pre-populated message to your representatives. So I put in my address and zip code, it pre-populated my representatives, pre-populated this message that you can just sign at the end and send. It's so easy. Uh, a lot of places will have this voter voice app, which is a similar thing. Um, so, you know, you do need to make sure that you agree with the content of the message. Maybe you don't agree with ACOG's stance on certain issues, so you wouldn't want to use this pre-populated message, but it makes it really, really easy. Okay, different, different way to get involved lobbying, which I'm sure we've all heard of, maybe we've never done, but we've been interested in. So there are many different types of lobbying. There are a lot of lobbying, lobby days for medical professionals. So the Wisconsin Doctor Day is a lobby day that um, took place this year on January 30th. There's also ACOG. ACOG has multiple different lobby days. State legislatures and state ACOG sections have multiple lobby days, but this is actually a congressional leadership conference. It's a lobbying boot camp. It's a week-long activity, um, and at the end of the week, the patient or the people, the patients, people who participated, go and lobby their representatives at Capitol Hill. It's it's great, and just so you all know that this is important. The Health Education Research Journal in December 2015 looked at the state legislators' sources for information, which I think we all know is important and we all think we would like to provide, but they also think it's important too and they want to hear from us. So in the article it states that the participants who were surveyed mentioned that they look to universities and educational institutions that they're working with on certain health issues, um, and that's who they look to for their sources, but that they often find it hard to know where to seek that information. So ultimately they wait for the information to come to them through other organizations. So I would argue that it's important that we offer that information to them through advocacy before it has to be funneled through different organizations and possibly lost in translation. Just so you know, it's important and they care. So why is advocacy important ultimately? It builds relationships and expands your reach as a physician, impacts more patients, and improves the care you provide. So you see multiple patients in a clinic day. Ultimately, if you're able to advocate on some issue, you're reaching even more than that. Protects your profession, not only from a reimbursement standpoint, but from a quality standpoint, and many more. Um, and it improves access and identifies resources for your patients. This is just among many other reasons that advocacy is important not just in women's health care, but across the board and, and multiple topics. So when you feel frustrated or overwhelmed, you want to put your head in the sand, you can either watch this YouTube video of Dr. Vader talking about hospital life, which I won't click on for the sake of time, but it is good. If you've never seen the Dr. Vader um, videos on YouTube, they're hilarious. Or you can remind yourself why you're doing this. So why am I advocating? Advocating for my stage, for my patients, for my family, um, and just don't give up. So with that, I will introduce Connie Schultz, who is the Director of Governmental Affairs for the University of Wisconsin Health and the School of Medicine and Public Health. She received her Bachelor of Arts in Public Relations and Master of Science in Communications from UW-Whitewater and has 20 years of experience working in state government, from representing the government relations of large health systems to serving as legislative liaison and legislative assistant in both the Wisconsin State Assembly and Senate. Connie has seen all sides of our state's important legislative issues. She has been with us at UW for about a year and a half and has successfully navigated a budget and legislative session. She lives in Sun Prairie with her husband of 21 years, with a 13 year old son, and her two dogs. Are we trading this now? Yeah. Do I get to be Janet Jackson now? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if my ears will work with this. Okay. Am I good?
Okay. All right, can I hold it? Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Summer, for that kind introduction. I'm Connie Schulze. Thank you. I am the Director of Government Affairs for UW Health and UW School of Medicine and Public Health. I've worked here for about a year and a half. It's been a wild ride. <laughs> In that year and a half, I've been through a budget cycle and a legislative session. So I have been busy since I, I came aboard. I have to admit that I've given this presentation three times before this in the last 45 days, and I was not nervous in any of those instances. In fact, I gave this presentation to Dean Golden and Dr. Kaplan, and a number of high-level executives slept just fine the night before. <laughs> but last night, I spent most of the night dreaming that I had slept through this and had to explain to Dr. Rice how that could happen. <laughs> So I'm sure many of you can relate, so. <laughs> so be kind to me is I guess what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so I, I hope this is a good spot to stand. So let's kick off with the biennial budget. So uh, the biennial budget was introduced on February 8th, 2017, and enacted into law on September 22nd, which was about three months later than when it was due. I mean, there's no penalty if they don't get it done by July 1st, but that's always the goal because that's the start of the new fiscal year. This is worth mentioning because all three branches, or, I'm sorry, the three offices of government that are impacted by the budget or lead the budget process were held by Republicans. So you would expect that if one party controlled everything, that a budget would sail through, right? No, not at all couldn't come to terms with a number of areas, in particular the transportation budget. So it was delayed, but ultimately got done. We, as an enterprise, had one primary budget request. That was we asked for $980,000 over the course of the biennium in ongoing funding, so not only those two years of the, the upcoming budget, but into perpetuity, we asked for an annual appropriation of about uh, 400 and, what is it, 440,000? Am I doing that? No, I can't do the math right now. I'm on, I'm on <laughs> just under half a million. Um, to support the tumor board so that we can expand access to the tumor board for oncologists and patients. And we can cover genomic testing for those in need. And we can formalize the process for collecting data and improving outcome, uh, data and the outcomes so that we can improve cancer care for patients all across Wisconsin and really potentially the nation. In addition to the money that we were able to get for the tumor board, there were other, other successes. We eliminated the ambulatory surgery center assessment, saving the enterprise about $700,000 annually. An additional $25 million was provided for the DISH program, which is the Disproportionate Share Hospital Funding Program. So if you serve a disproportionate share of underinsured or uninsured patients, you get a little sweetener. We, uh, we were able to secure that. Um, the legislature fully funded MA, no cuts to provider rates, which is a big victory. That's not what the other states were experiencing. The Wisconsin Rural Physician Residency Assistance Program we received about $200,000 in new funding. There was a, a million and a half dollars put in for GME training. And the Farm to School Coordinator position was saved, which is something we advocated for. In addition, a million dollars was provided in the budget to expand the Child Psychiatry Consultation Program, which a number of our physicians access to help with the behavioral health shortage. Uh, the law was amended to allow for an opt-out of the birth defect registry. It was, before this law was passed, an opt-in, which really, um, which uh, made Wisconsin an outlier, outlier and made data collection more difficult. And then in terms of where funding wasn't uh, put in that we consider a success, they chose not to fund the proposed College of Osteopathic Medi Medicine in Jefferson County. And they chose not to move towards a self-insurance model for state employees. We owe these two gentlemen uh, a debt of gratitude. They serve on the UW Health Authority Board, but they also serve on the state's budget writing committee. 
So we have two advocates from right within our enterprise that serve on the committee that helps to write the budget. So they were very helpful to us. Obviously, there was more to do in the 18 months of the budget or of the legislative session than just the budget. We also had some uh, session priorities. Protecting access to fetal tissue for research was among our top priorities. We joined the Cures for Tomorrow Coalition. We've actually been a part of this coalition for I think it's six years now, um, which is made up of UW Madison, UW Health, Wharf, the Medical College of Wisconsin, BioForward, and while they're not on here, a quasi member is also Badger Advocates. So there were two pieces of legislation that were introduced that dealt with fetal tissue. The one on the left, the clayfish molt, or well, I guess it'd be your right. <laughs> the one on the, the your right, the clay, clayfish molten bill, is for all essence the ban. It would ban access to tissue and would basically shut down our ability to do life-saving research. The Duco Darling bill, on the other hand, was not legislation that we supported or opposed. It would leg it was legislation that would have had it passed put additional constraints on fetal tissue research, but would not have stopped it altogether. What happened, because there were two bills, this is the first time this has happened in this debate, which has been going on for about six or eight years, is it split the vote. There was not enough support for either among uh, conservative Republicans who lead both houses um, to get anything moving. So, any changes to access to fetal tissue for research failed to pass, and we continue working as we have been. This brings us to something that's probably of great interest to most everyone in the room, and I would say if I had to put a number on the amount of time I spent lobbying on any one issue, I would say that this one got about 60%. So this gentleman here, Representative Andre Jacques, in March circulated a bill that would, in essence, eliminate our ability to have an OBGYN residency program because we would not be able to be accredited under the terms of his bill. We wrote a letter to legislators that was signed by Dean Golden and Dr. Kaplan that said, please do not sign onto this legislation. It's a terrible idea. It was three pages long. Here are all the reasons that it's a terrible idea. Well, a few weeks later, the bill came out as introduced, which means it's now formally moving through the process, and it had 28 co-sponsors. So our message was lost on them. We were very concerned. Not long after that, you'll see this is dated April 10th, Representative Jacques, I think feeling emboldened by that success that he had had in securing so many co-sponsors, did this article, and in essence, um, portrayed the information that we had provided in that letter as factually inaccurate, and had also said that there's really no reason to be concerned about this because they have the same, uh, they have a bill in Arizona that's almost exactly like what I'm proposing, and yet they remain as an accredited program there. So what, you're sa what the other side is saying is just all smoke and mirrors. Well, we have great legal minds that work for us, and it took them about 15 minutes <laughs> to, <laughs> to figure out that what Representative Jacques was actually portraying, those were the factual inaccuracies. And so this is a, a quick summary of the bill, but obviously the entire thing gave us great pause. But it's that first line that performers assist with performing an abortion that was the greatest concern, because we know that OBGYN residents are required or we as a program are required to make that training available to them. You can opt out if you have a moral or religious obligation for doing so, but we as a program by ACGME standards are required to provide that. So, oops, well, there's your good news, but <laughs> so, so we went, uh, we, we began working hard to change the messaging on this. And this is just a sampling of the documents that we put together, and each of these documents is multiple pages, but you know, when I say that I do a lot of writing, this is a great demonstration of that. Usually on an issue um, where you're working with legislators, you might do one or two briefing papers, sometimes an initial paper to kind of explain what it is. It's usually about two pages, and then maybe one other as follow-up. 
But time and again, we were having to do these papers to keep responding to represent Jacques because he kept changing his messaging. So um, to say it was a challenge, uh, it was a, about 13 months, <laughs> a very challenging debate. Um, but we, we fortunately were successful in the outcome. <laughs> And that legislation failed to pass, although we really do anticipate it will come back next session. Um, so we're going to be in the midst of this battle again. I don't typically open it up for questions at this point, but I, I feel like I want to because I want, I want you to be able to ask anything, you know, kind of while we're in the midst of this discussion. If you have any questions, maybe I'm being presumptuous. Yes, Dr. Higgins. Thank you so much. What are some lessons you learned in this last session? It sounds like there's so much work that you think yeah. you, you know, that are key takeaways for you or things that you're keeping in mind and it is reproposed in the next session. Yeah, well, we had great help from other stakeholders. Um, I'm going to go right to Planned Parenthood because obviously they were a big stakeholder in this. And we worked really closely with them and we worked closely on messaging. Um, because of who controls the legislature. We had to be really careful about messaging. We did not want this to become strictly a discussion about abortion. We wanted to make sure that the message stayed on women's health care and access to care. And the fact that there is a shortage of OBGYNs in the state and something like this would exacerbate that shortage dramatically. So had Planned Parenthood taken a different approach and showed up to the two committee hearings with t-shirts and, and banners and signs and whatever, the message would have become almost solely about the abortion debate. And the fact that they were sensitive to that and didn't do that was very helpful. Also, ACOT was very helpful to us. When legislators hear from their physicians that live in their districts, and those physicians who come with an automatic level of respect, say to them, this is a bad idea, and here are the reasons why, that, that was tremendously helpful. Um, the Nurse Midwives Association got involved. Um, i trying to think. Uh, Wisconsin Medical Society got involved. Medical College of Wisconsin got involved. They're also training OBGYNs, but they recognize that this would be bad for the profession and bad for patient access across the board. So having those you know, that really great support network, which I had experienced with the Curious Coalition because we were all constantly coming together and working for the same outcome. I didn't have that with this because really we were standing alone in this fight. They had targeted us in that, that bill with very specific language. So I didn't know what other support I could expect. So I was really, really pleased to see that. So if I have to do this fight again, I'm, I'm hoping that I can depend on that same level of support. Um, you know, I guess what I take away from this is, is and I, I hate to use this example because I think it minimizes the significance of this, but you may remember a few years ago there was a, a raw milk bill. In 2009, when Democrats controlled everything, the raw milk bill, which would have allowed people access to raw milk in a um, very unregulated way, um, made its way all the way to Governor Doyle's desk. And Surprisingly, Governor Doyle vetoed it on like the last day he could. Um, and, and he chose to do that, you know, for public health reasons. He said that the risk was, was not worth, worth the potential reward to a few. Um, if you look at that bill, at that time, there were people showing up in van loads and bus loads and they had their signs and this was their thing. They could not, I mean, this was so important to them. And there were, you know, 30, probably 40 people on that bill. Well, here we are, fast forward to 2018. I don't think that bill was even introduced last year. So, you know, it, 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 you begin to marginalize the, the group that is so actively pursuing something. And I think there's the potential to do that here too. I think as long as we continue to keep the message on the impact this will have on patient care and access to care, I think that we'll continue to have Yes, Dr. Uh, thanks, Yeah. Um, 
Given what's happened this year and what your experience has been with the fetal tissue kind of coalition, if you will, um, should we be thinking about having a coalition around women's health care and women's health care disparity issues in the state that's even more proactive, that includes some of our problems with infant and maternal mortality yeah. in rural areas, uh, uh, health disparities based on ethnicity and race, yeah. um, around delivery, um, as well as the training issues, the workforce issues in the and across the state, and, and, and have, have a group that's actively working on that from a advocacy and legislative standpoint. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Amy Williamson and I have talked about that too, and yeah, that's absolutely something I would love to see. And I would love to see you engaging like the Children's Caucus and and uh, legislators from both sides of the aisle. We don't know what November is going to bring. I mean, we're hearing about a blue wave that may or may not come to fruition. But you always want to make sure that you're working with legislators on both sides of the aisle, because in my 20 years, I've seen, <laughs> seen the power switch many times. And that, that, their involvement is so critical to how policy can move forward or not. So yeah, I would absolutely say start you know, coalescing around those issues, start talking very openly about them, start thinking about policy change that you'd like to see. Of course, I'm here to help with that wherever I can, and uh, start engaging lawmakers wherever you can. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, then we'll move on. Uh, another uh, primary piece of legislation that we worked hard to defeat was a fee schedule imposed upon providers for workers' comp patients. This is, again, something that's been proposed to uh, previous sessions and um, hasn't, it's, it's really, the support for this is really becoming marginalized. The second time it was uh, moving, it got a lot of support and we were really, really concerned. But this third time, uh, the support was so minimal in the legislature that they weren't even able to get an assembly bill introduced. They were only able to get a Senate bill introduced. So, yeah. So there was a Senate committee hearing, but they never even took a vote to get it out of committee. So, very, very good news there. Uh, we had some other bills that we supported, opposed, or monitored due to their potential impact on our enterprise, our patients, and alignment with our community health improvement plan. I won't go through the entire list. I mean, you can kind of read it as we go here, but um, this is all legislation where we took some kind of stand, either through joining on a coalition letter or registering at the committee hearing a position or um, you know, just uh, pursuing a, a position. And that the up arrow means that in these instances, we got everything that we wanted. Of course, there were some, I hate to call them failures, but there were some outcomes that we hadn't hoped for. Um, we had tried to get retailers to put nicotine products behind the counter so they were less accessible to kids. We can't seem to get any real footing with that, unfortunately. That's the second or third time that's been introduced. Um, we wanted to get some money for the Reach Out and Read program to support physicians having books in their clinics. Didn't get any luck with that either. Um, and then the Harvest of Hope uh, grant program, uh, that came down to a real turf war between um, food banks. So we think that we can work through that for the next session. And then there were just a couple of other bills that we were monitoring but didn't take a position on. The right to try legislation, I'm sure you heard that Senator Johnson's version just passed at the federal level. There was also a state version um, and then uh, this enabling language that would allow for direct primary care agreements, they are in essence allowed now. There are a couple of physicians who do them, but they're concerned that the Office of the Commissioner of Insurance will come in and, and um, indicate that they're selling insurance, so they want some enabling language. We didn't take a position on this, but they're going to do a legislative council study committee over the summer to study the pros and cons of this, and we have recommended one of our physicians serve on that committee as a representative of medical school. In addition to just getting bills passed, we had a number of individuals we needed to get through the Senate confirmation process. We had Dr. Al, uh, Dr. Ala Absied, 
who uh, leads our pain clinic on Park Street. He was confirmed as a new member of the Medical Examining Board. Mr. Walter, who chairs our uh, UW Health Authority Board, was confirmed to the board. And then Mr. Litcher and Mr. Sanchez are uh, returning members to the board. They were also confirmed. That's it. That's my contact information in case you have any questions. Um, and I was going to just augment one thing that, that Dr. Wallace said, and that was she talked about ACOG and how you can get your information about who represents you and et cetera. Another really good website is legis, L-E-G-I-S, dot W-I dot gov. That's the, the Wisconsin State Legislature's homepage. And there's a search bar in there that says who represents me. If you put in your, your street address, the same information will come up. It won't give you that really nice <laughs> pre-written uh, you know, um, uh, information to, to send to your lawmaker, but it will um, help you find out who represents you. And then you also can sign up for alerts for various legislation if you, you know, I have a million different key terms in my search bar, health, healthcare, insurance, but you know, if there's something in particular that you really wanna watch for, you can put that in and then those alerts get pushed out to you when legislation is introduced. Here. <laughs> Questions from an expert. <laughs>
areas that I work with, like the American College of Surgeons, which accepts many colleges. So, two things. First, educating and speaking up. So, when it comes to OBGYN and our specialty is true. And these topics within our specialty become very heated very quickly. So, you know, ultimately educating yourself, <coughs> all of us, on, on what's going on, on the, on the different perspectives. So, even though you might feel the visceral reaction to a certain Senate bill, you should know the other side. Um, so, educating yourself on that and then ultimately educating others, and that's where the speaking up comes in. I think. Like you were mentioning, everyone um, who's sitting in a room to make policy is the, most of the time they are not physicians and they are acting based on their beliefs and on their um, what they think is the right thing to do. And if we don't speak up and we aren't able to offer them, hopefully, objective information um, to make an informed and correct decision, like kind of talking about, it's important to show them. You might be making this bill based on your beliefs, and, and maybe I believe that too, as a physician, or I'm sorry, as a person. Maybe I believe I agree with you, but ultimately, for Wisconsin, this is not the right thing. And I think that's where it kind of bridges into medicine in general. So, um, I think the stepping stone is probably our individual specialty, and since OBGYN is such a hot topic, it's easy to just within that, which is definitely fine. There's plenty to talk about in PGY and I'm plenty to advocate for, but it's definitely a stepping stone to, um, to the next level uh, as for medicine in general, especially as far as access. That's what I was going to add. I mean, patient access for women impacts entire families. So, you know, it's, it's easy for one to transition into the other. Since, since Dr. Lippert talked, can I just add one success? It's not on my list, and I don't know why I keep forgetting it, but I'm going to tell just a two-minute story about Dr. Lippert. So she and I have been working together since I, <laughs> since I came aboard. Uh, I think we met within like two weeks of my coming aboard. You reached out and said, hey, we should meet. <laughs> I was like, okay. So um, Dr. Lippert is very active and was at Dr. Day um, at the Capitol. And I assumed she would be. I wasn't there. I had other commitments. Um, but then I heard um, about a month later, um, hey, I just got this bill passed, and we want to do a press conference. <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> and so she had gone in as part of her doctor day discussions and had talked about her work on the Stop the Bleed program and had convinced the legislative aide that she was working with, even though that wasn't one of the topics of discussion <laughs> for Dr. Day, had convinced the legislative aide who happened to work in the assembly majority leader's office uh, that there should be a Stop the Bleed campaign recognition day. And next thing I know, this is moving, she, she got it through the assembly without me even knowing that, that we were, in essence, behind it. And then I helped get it, get it through the Senate. Um, and the governor signed it, of course. So we had a Stop the Bleed press conference and uh, a recognition of Trauma Day, all thanks to one conversation that Dr. Lippert had as part of her Dr. Day discussion. So when you say that you can make things happen <laughs> as a physician, your influence is tremendous. And um, that, that illustrates that. So thank you. Very much, Connie. Um, in terms of advocacy, I um, I will give credit to Sarah Finger for educating me as yeah. to how to step into um, being more active, proactive, mm -hmm. related to women's health issues in the state. Yeah. How do you, if you do, um, how do you collaborate with the Wisconsin Alliance for Women and Sarah Finger and all? You know, I don't. I haven't worked with Sarah since I came aboard here. Um, I think Sarah and I worked in the Capitol at the same time together, so I think we know of each other, but we don't know each other personally. Um, and truth be told, the last 18 months, I've had my hands full um, and have been been very involved. Um, you know, with the, the issues that I've identified here and, and a host of others. So I believe my connection to Sarah has been through. And I guess an, an inadvertent connection to Sarah through um, uh, uh, Planned Parenthood and her name, uh, it's not Tara, the, the lobbyist for Planned Parenthood, her name is escaping me. 
Nicole, <laughs> yeah, sorry, through Nicole, who I know works closely with Sarah. So we've had, um, I guess you could say, uh, an arm's length connection at this point, but I'm hoping that'll change in the future. It's just been a matter of time. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious about how we get the OBGYN rural residency included in the rural residency expansion in the budget which is a big concern. My understanding is we are the only resident rural residency not currently funded. Um, and also I was wondering if there's a resource, it being an election year, that either Badger Advocates or anything ACOG perhaps puts out talking about prospective candidates that are really good on both the university and women's health issues. Um, it's kind of as a dumping ground for those yeah. who want to be involved on the offensive during an election. Yeah, those two are great resources for that. They will undoubtedly do candidate surveys, and then you'll Badger be able to- Advocates. Badger Advocates and the ACOG. Um, they'll do candidate surveys, and then you'll be able to go online and read the candidate surveys, and um, they'll make recommendations for, you know, we're endorsing candidate A or candidate B for these reasons. I'm, I'm sure they'll do that. Um, the rural, so you're talking about the rural track, OBGYN, yes. Dr. Laura. Um, who I met a little bit. <laughs> she's here, oh my gosh, she's right in the front row. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Laura. <laughs> Again, kind of an ancillary connection, not, not so much a direct one, but. So um, I've been talking with, um, is Julie here too? Jody? Jody. Jody Silva Lund. She, anyway, I've been talking with Jody about this. And I'm, I'm gonna be really frank right now, and, and I haven't had a chance to talk to you about this, Doctor, um, and, and I wanna talk to uh, Dr. Rice about this too. So my hesitation with pursuing a budget ask around this is, I know there are other entities that want to pursue this, and I, I feel that I should let them take the lead, and I'm saying that because I am afraid that if I become the face of this, and as a result, UW Health and UW School of Medicine become the face of this, it is going to go back to that issue. And those legislators that were so adamant, that fought so hard to see us shut down our OBGYN residency program will stand in the way of that ask. So if I can, have success in another way without being the face of it, that is right now where I stand. Now, I can be convinced otherwise. I want to have this conversation with you, I want to have this conversation with Dr. Rice, but after talking with Jody and after having an informal conversation with someone at the Department of Health Services um, and other other entities that will be instrumental in getting this included in the governor's budget. Um, I think there are other ways to go to get to where we need to go. I probably have time for one more question. Is there one more? I just want to thank the speakers again. I really, really appreciate this. I just wanted, I've been thinking and I was talking a little bit to Eliza. I really, really appreciate your point, Connie, that and Ellen's point too, how can we integrate abortion training or abortion care into a broader, more um, bipartisan, potentially issue. I do, on the other hand, as a patient advocate, get worried sometimes that we, in that, re-stigmatize abortion and move forward with this notion that abortion by itself isn't okay for people, right? And we know from research that sort of the greater internalized, internalized stigma, the more emotional problems patients have after abortion, right? And so I think I totally appreciate from a legislative um, uh, angle why we need to have abortion be part of a very broad landscape of women's health. But I also don't want us to re-stigmatize why abortion by itself is, is okay. And I think I just wanted to make that comment really briefly, so. And, I, and I'm sensitive to that and I understand it. I would just say that I have to know my audience. Yeah, right. And I, I have to know what will and, and won't work. Isn't 
just elective abortion. Like we use that term for other things. And so we stigmatize it because we're talking about one type of abortion which everybody has an opinion on. And ultimately it's important that our training, our residents are trained on that. And that we have access to that because it's not just elected. It's not just the women walking in the office that said that I want abortion. So making sure that you educate, and even though they might hear you while they're in your while you're in the office telling them all that I just said, and then go another way, at least you spoke up and if you continue to do so, eventually it will be heard. Thank you both for your yes. time and your talks. It was great. <laughs>